Hello, everyone. This week's live stream is going to be an open topic. We can discuss all of your questions that I have no topic specifically in mind, but who knows what stories we'll get into. So often, I usually have a topic where I discuss for about 45 minutes, but today I have nothing. I've been working all week, and I'm just trying to get things done, and um, I had no inspiration. Nothing really came into my mind. We can talk about my reef briefly, because I have been working on it the last couple of days. You can see it's nice and shiny behind me. Uh, I did all my water testing already, so I have already beat you to water test Saturday, or at least most of you. And uh, we will see, uh, you know, what kind of results you give me back in this conversation, on this chat. Hi, Ed. How are you? I um, <clears throat> went ahead and tested my tank yesterday for all my parameters because I had some... Uh, <laughs> I was on a phone call and I thought, you know what, I could use this time for something else. So while I was chatting with my friend, I went ahead and I went through all my parameters at the same time. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Dave. Reefer Madness. Jeff. Vince loves fish. I'm glad you could catch a stream, too. I'm glad we're doing this at the same time. Um, tank's doing really well. Water parameters-wise, everything came back normal except phosphates measured high. But I might have made a mistake during the test because uh, it was crazy blue, which means it's very high, uh, like closer to 1.0. And I, of course, once I see that, I just treated my tank with phosphate RX. So I put some of that in the tank. The tank got cloudy. A few hours later, I... Uh, saw the tank was nice and clear like it is now, and I went ahead and tested the phosphates today, and they're <laughs> somewhere between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1, which is great. So either I made a mistake yesterday and did not use the full water sample for that test, which is 10 milliliters, or Phosphate Direct worked fantastically like it always does. Now, since I'm talking about Phosphate Direct for a second, I do want to mention that um, sometimes people will say that some or a few of their fish are affected adversely, you know, that, like they're freaking out, the fish are dying. And I've never run into that, and I don't know why. So I wanted to throw this out there uh, because I've never been able to dial it into exactly what happens. I realize I'm, tre I'm treating a really big tank compared to many of you. Several of you have smaller tanks, and maybe in an all-in-one, it's different than it is for, you know, a a 75-gallon reef tank, or a 120-gallon reef tank, or a 400-gallon reef tank. So I would just say don't use the maximum dose. You know, if the dose is six drops per 10 gallons of liquid volume, use five drops per 10 gallons of liquid volume, so you're underdosing slightly. Myself, my system, because it is um, 450 gallons of liquid volume, I would need 45 times uh, six, which would be like 200 and I don't know, 80 drops or something. And I don't use that much. I usually use 125 to 180. Probably yesterday I pushed it around 200. And I watched my yellow tangs swim around like no big deal, where yellow tangs are the first one I've ever heard anyone complain about in the past that it was doing badly. So I'm just saying don't dose the full strength. And maybe you'll see um, the same results I see. I don't know. I don't really know why it is. There have been times where I've used the full strength and my reef continued to be fine. But maybe I have way more circulation, way more flow. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could button it down to the exact thing so I could say, watch out for this. But um, Potassium was up a little bit, which was weird because I haven't dosed it in a month and I haven't done a water change since January. I do have 250 gallons of salt water behind the reef ready for water change. I would like to do one here, um, I don't know, soon, as in like in the next seven days. We'll see if I have the time to squeeze it in. Uh, magnesium was 1350, which I'd like that to be a little higher. Calcium was 400. Uh, uh, alkalinity was 9.5. So salinity is always the same, 1.026 or 35 PPT. pH was 8.2 at the time, and temperature of the tank was 78.3 degrees. So there is that. Um, I did want to mention that uh, I'd mentioned last week the website got updated and during this week a few more tweaks were made. So if you are buying things from Me Loves Reef, please do let me know if you run into something strange. You know, if shipping just seems abnormally or insanely high for some reason, for example, let me know. Don't just blow me off and go to some other website. Just tell me what you're seeing so I can maybe dial in whatever problem that might be. But I do think we've got that kind of locked up. Uh, last week's topic was about taking care of SPS corals, and that was from an, I had written an article on that a very long time ago, probably 10 years ago, 
and that article was missing from my website. So it is now available in the articles section. If you wanted to read it in five minutes instead of listen to me talk for an hour, <laughs> you can find it there. Now the information is dated. I talk about how important metal halides are, which I'm sure many of you are rolling your eyes at uh, because we're 10, 12 years later and uh, we all have LEDs, including myself. So I understand, you know, if you, um, you know, just take it with a grain of salt, slight changes have been made, but overall the information is completely valid from top to bottom of that article. All right. Uh, all right, let's find a question. And uh, I see lots more of you are greeting me here. We already have 55 people in here. I guess no one else is live streaming today. So I get the whole audience. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Adam says, the tank looks fantastic. Thank you so much for saying that. I do appreciate it. I did clean the front glass and the side glass. I did not clean the back. I also did not run carbon yet, which I haven't done in months, and I need to do that. It would make the water more clear. Uh, I realize you're looking at the tank when it's very blue. Let me go ahead and make it less blue just for the fun of it. So what I'm doing is I'm logging into my Apex Fusion. I will go to my profiles and I will select streaming. And that is my tank under what kind of looks more like daylight rather than a blue hue. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. Aftershock is here from Wales. What's the weather like in Wales? What time is it in Wales? I don't even know. Uh, uh, <laughs> trying to say the name. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I got that right. Can you please tell us more on the Acropor eating flatworms? You were trying different products. KZ, if I remember. I haven't tried any products yet. All I did was uh, blow off the corals that were in question. And, you know, I would literally go with a turkey baster and just blow off each SPS coral to see if anything came flying off. Originally, they all came off of the Drew's Acro, which is that coral right there. And now it has no flatworms and it has turned red again, which is exactly what I wanted. Uh, I don't know specifically what the situation is in my tank, but I have been told by some to use flatworm stop by uh, KZ, I believe. And it's not to get rid of the flatworms necessarily, but apparently it beefs up the skin on the coral so that the acroporing and flatworms don't want to eat them. So I need to buy that, and I heard it's expensive, and I haven't even tr Googled where to find it yet. I need to do that. Uh, Estonian Reefer says, what coral is your oldest coral, and how many years have you had it? Oh, man. Well, this giant one right here is a lithophylon. I've had it at least 10 years. In the background, that one right there, that's a Blue Ridge coral. I've had that one probably since 2003. Uh, that might be the oldest coral in my tank right now. The anemones that I have go back to 2002. Um, the fungias I've had for 10 or 15 years where they make more of themselves. You know what? I need to get my wristwatch. I feel naked. <laughs> you can't do a live stream naked. YouTube frowns on it. Plus, I need to know what time it is. All right, better. Um, I think those are the oldest ones you know, that I mentioned. You know, I mean, SPS corals, I've had the Shadowcaster for about 10, 12 years. I don't even know the source of where that coral came from. The hammers go way back. They probably go back to 2003, 2004. I'm pretty sure they came with the 55-gallon aquarium I got. Or I set up the 55-gallon aquarium, you know, whatever's in it, and got some hammers that year. But yeah, my stuff goes back way, way, way back. <clears throat> uh, Sharks 3D Man, I'm so sorry to hear you were sick. I'm trying to avoid getting sick. And uh, by the way, I know you guys always love when I talk about this. Apparently there's some risk of COVID, another variant coming through the US soon. And it's already shown up on the uh, East Coast because it comes from Europe first. So heads up, be careful. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. I remember, I, God, what was it, two years ago? They were saying, you know, you shouldn't touch your face because there's a good chance whatever's on your hands, you'll get in your mouth and your eyes. And all I did was touch my face nonstop. And I just said, I'm doomed. <laughs> there's no way I'm going to survive COVID because I can't keep my hands off my face. I've gotten better. Um, but 
it is important to uh, you know avoid getting an infection of any kind from any kind of sickness. So I, I find it humorous that I'll see a memory on Facebook where I was talking about uh, Nicolas Cage from the movie Face Off. And I was like, the only solution I have is to get a fresh face because I'm going to touch this one and kill it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, so if you guys aren't listening to me right now, that's OK. And if you are and you and you agree with me, that's OK, too. I, I don't want to get into a whole debate about it. I just want everyone to be happy and safe and uh, not stressed out and uh, and live a long life. Let's see. Uh, Reefer Madness says, I moved my tank 30 miles to my shop for everyone to enjoy. I learned that moving a tank a long distance is a little different than going from one end of the house to the other. Now that it's over, everything is starting to come back. Everything was in shock, but it's coming back around. So that's great. And he says his local reef store has reef roads, reef roids, reef roads, reef roids. Yeah. And he says, do you want to use them? No, I don't. I use Ben Reef, which I used this week. Uh, I know I haven't been doing the reef diaries for you guys. You know, I did it for, you know, that 130 days in a row. And then we took a break and I just haven't found the inspiration to resume that series. Uh, I know many of you liked it. I kind of think it served its purpose. Maybe I'll think of something else later, but, um, I just feel like to go back to that would be kind of just rerunning what we did because what I did in the Reef Diary series was tell you what I'm doing with my tank each day. And of course, the things we do with our tank becomes repetitive. Every Saturday, we're testing water. Every once in a while, we're changing carbon. Uh, it's time to clean the skimmer. It's time to vacuum the sump. I'm cleaning the glass again and again and again and again. And, you know, th that kind of stuff, if I were to start documenting that again, you'd say, well, this is like Reef Diary 17. This is like Reef Diary 23. <laughs> so uh, the only thing that was unique to the Reef Diary was the fact that I had this horrible situation with the potassium that bottomed out of my tank and lost, lost many corals. And all I did was dose more in to fix the problem. And the tank is just continuing to grow and look better all the time. So uh, there's no real fascination to resume a daily diary, in my opinion. Let's see, I feel like I skipped something. Uh, John says, I absolutely love the hobby, but now that I have bought a new house, I really can't afford it. I'm debating on getting rid of all the coral and going fowler, which is fish only with live rock. What fish would you recommend for 300? Mm, well, if you are gonna have just a tank with a pile of rocks, you're gonna want some of the prettiest fish ever. Uh, the nice thing about a 300 gallon is you have a lot of swimming space. So you could go with larger fish because you don't have to really worry about a bio load affecting the corals. But that doesn't mean you have to ignore the water quality. You're still gonna to have to maintain some decent filtration. Uh, matter of fact, the bigger fish and the hardier ones that really devour food, like let's say you start putting in predators that are eating a lot of meaty foods are really gonna max the bio uh, filter of your tank and you may discover you have to add some extra things down in the sump to uh, to uh, keep up with the constant waste that's happening in the aquarium for example let's say you had a panther grouper and an eel and a lionfish and a stingray you know let's say you had it wide open with you know a lot of open sand uh, and then the foods you're going to put in they're going to be big chunky morsels and what if you have put a puffer they're really messy eaters now i've never kept a fish only with live rock tank. Never once. I always wanted to put corals in there and enjoy a reef tank. So uh, I actually was on the phone yesterday with Ben Johnson of Reef Beef and I was talking to him about someone who's got an issue with one of their tanks. And I was trying to figure out what I may be overlooking, what I um, don't know enough about. And he had suggested the type of ceramic media that some systems come with inside of a reactor so that you literally are creating this really good biological filtration besides a protein scammer and a filter sock and water changes. And um, maybe fowlers need that. I, I might have to pull out a book from the good old days and do some reading as well to see if there's something else that uh, has been overlooked. But the other thing that I could, you could keep in mind with your tank is you don't have to get rid of all the corals. You just have to quit buying more. <laughs> you can enjoy your reef tank in your new home and just have simple things in there. You could go from all the hard corals and the chalices and stuff to a bunch of softy corals that are inexpensive 
they grow prolifically, they move in the flow, which is nice for when you have company over, and the maintenance is far easier as compared to having LPS corals and SPS corals and clams and, and filter feeders. You know, if you get it down to devil's hand and toadstool leathers and uh, finger gorgonians and green star polyps and pulsing zinnia, I mean, all the things I would never put in my tank. But if you wanted to fill your tank up with that, you could have this really pretty tank with some fish swimming around and people would enjoy it and wouldn't have any clue. And your maintenance would be far easier than it is to take care of something that's like this behind me where I have to be a little more meticulous and on top of it on a regular basis. Those are my thoughts. Uh, let's see. The next one says... Hillbilly Reefer says, due to an Aptasia breakout, low nutrients and high alkalinity, my, my tank crashed. So there's a lot of things going wrong. Having tried the copper band, peppermint shrimp, and file fish, I'm giving the copper band one more try before trying Bergia and nudibranchs, which takes time. Yeah, the, uh, I don't know why your tank crashed specifically. You didn't mention that one, but we want to, uh, and you know what? You just said low nutrients and high alkalinity. You've got to have low nutrients, low alkalinity or high nutrients, high alkalinity. But when it comes to getting rid of Aptasia, f Aptasia is a product I sell for my website. It works really well. It, it goes on top of the coral and coats it completely and becomes a hardened crust that's got acid inside that kills whatever's underneath the coating. So you could start frosting over those things instead of hoping for some kind of animal to kill it off. The only thing you have to watch out for is don't get the f Aptasia on something else that you care about. So you got to be uh, careful. And the way it works specifically, you have to stir and shake and really mix it well before you use it. I mean, you have to really go all in to really mix the bottle. And then once you've got it mixed up perfectly, then you turn off all the flow in your tank, no circulation whatsoever, and you apply it on top of the uh, Aptasia that are bothering you. And then you wait a good hour before you turn the flow back on. And when you turn the flow on, if you start seeing the white stuff flowing into the water column, turn off the flow again and wait another 15, 20 minutes. You want that stuff to be completely hardened. So when you turn the flow on, nothing's moving uh, from what you've applied to the, the Aptasia, but everything else in the tank is back to normal. And your tank will be fine for an hour without uh, internal circulation. So don't freak out. But uh, I would suggest that it works out really well. A lot of people enjoy it. I only sell the large bottle because if you're going to pay for shipping, you might as well get a decent amount. And it's $25 for a two ounce bottle. Uh, Dave says, how would you tackle getting the phosphate and nitrates out of rock before reusing it? I've bleached it, but that only gets rid of the organics and not specifically the phosphate. Well, I mean, you could put it in a, a vat of some kind. You could run a protein skimmer in that vat. You can use phosphate RX to get it out of the system. The other thing you're going to want to do is with that big vat that I'm, or the barrel or whatever you're going to use to put this rock in, you want to take it in your hands and just shake it under salt water really, really hard to get all the detritus out of it. And then, you know, like I said, using phosphate RX and using a, a protein skimmer and doing a big water change once a week for a few weeks, you'll probably remove almost all of it from there before you put it in your tank and be ready to use. But that whole shaking the rock off in the salt water weekly will make a huge difference rapidly versus just putting rock in salt water with a lot of flow. So you want to really shake it off. <laughs> it sounds hard, and it kind of is. I mean, you'll definitely you know get some some activity points if you're wearing one of these uh, electronic monitors on your wrist. Adam says, do you test and or dose potassium? Yes, I use this test kit from Fauna Marin. That's why it has a K on there. And it's kind of an, a convoluted test. There's a lot to do in it. I still, I have mentioned it a dozen times, if not 20 times. I have not tried the Salaford one yet. But here is the kit with all of its little bottles and vials and syringes. Well, needle tip, uh, 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 what do you call it? <laughs> I can't think of what they're called. Uh, but it works pretty well. It just takes a little while. It takes about seven, eight minutes to do the test. And then I dose Fauna Marin's Elementals K. 
and uh, I think I think I'm on my fourth bottle, but I haven't had it turned on to the dosing pump for a couple of months because my number was above 400, so I just left it there. But yes, I do test potassium each week just to see where the numbers are. Uh, Rob Upstate New York says, your thoughts on adding hermit crabs or red or blue legs, legged hermits, and mixing with turbo snails to control algae. Are the snails doomed for the shells? No, they're not. You know, you will lose some snails that a hermit crab will opportunistically pick up. You may even have a snail killed by a, an aggressive hermit crab. But if you put in 100 snails and you put in 100 crabs, you're not going to have 100 hermit crabs and no snails. You know, there will always be some that will be on the glass or on the rock work, and you'll have a few that you'll discover are empty on the bottom of the tank. You don't know why, because a fish ate them. And then, you know, a worm consumed it, and then, you know, like a bristle worm. And then, you know, maybe a hermit may, you know, you might find five or ten hermits actually use a shell. But for the most part, no, it's not, they're not doomed, and you should definitely do it from time to time. It's uh, something that I don't forget about. As I look at my reef, I look at everything, and I see what do I need to do. And is it time to buy more snails or more hermit crabs? Now, a while back, I was just using only snails. And I know there's some people out there that totally believe that hermit crabs are evil and you should never get them. And I don't know where... I mean, I understand. <laughs> I understand, but I don't understand where people come up with these thoughts. You know, it just enters their head like, oh, they're all evil. I'll never use one again. I don't know what hermit crab could do so much damage on a reef tank that you're like, I swear them off entirely. Um... I guess that's the problem if you're buying zoanthid polyps one at a time for 120 bucks a polyp, then yeah, if one gets pulled off a frag plug, you're suddenly going to hate that hermit crab. But what about the other 90 hermit crabs you have? Are they all evil? And was that hermit crab even trying to hurt the zoanthid? Was it just trying to eat the glue underneath? I mean, these are some of the things that happen in our tanks because they're crabs. They're just walking around doing their thing every single day. So if you want... and so there was a point where I was only putting snails in my tank. I just hadn't bought hermits in a long time. And I was looking at my anemone cube and there was algae growing out of the rock work and the snails weren't doing anything with it. And I thought, what is the deal? And, you know, like the humble reefer that I am, I'm down to the fish drawer and I say, hey, Frank, um, I got hair algae growing in my anemone cube. It's kind of unusual. And I've got snails. And he says, well, how many hermits do you have? And I was like, I don't think there's any hermits in there. And he says, well, there you go. So I bought, you know, whatever I bought, 10, 15, 20 of them, put them in that tank. And I swear an hour later, you just saw the hermits right there on those patches of algae just ripping it off and consuming it. I was like, how did I forget this? You know, <laughs> so I do recommend hermits. Um, I think the red legged ones are less aggressive than the blue legs. Um, and then there's other ones that are more ornamental, more pretty. Um, and I like to add them for looks rather than to be industrious little workers. So the scarlet hermit crab is really pretty to look at. It also eats algae, but they're very expensive. And so most people don't like to buy very many. And so if you buy two or three, you have something pretty to look at. The Halloween hermit crab is another pretty one with blue stripes on its legs. That's another nice one that you could get that could make a, a difference in the tank and also be enjoyable to look at. So it's not just a bunch of worker bees. Sometimes you get a few things just for looks, just because they're nice. Uh, never on... Uh, Overlook the value of an urchin in your tank. There are lots of different kinds on the market. The diadema is really well known for consuming green hair algae, but they also are the ones that stab us in our knuckles when we're cleaning the tank because we don't notice until we get stabbed and it's like, ugh. Uh, right now I've got a whole bunch of tuxedo urchins in my tank and I find that they are doing a great job and they're getting bigger. And uh, I need to pull one out and put it in my palm and take a picture for you guys. But uh, I've noticed some are completely decorated in all kinds of shrapnel they're finding on the sand bed, and you can barely see the urchin. It's kind of fun. It's nice to see that in the tank. But I do recommend a mixture of cleanup crew for your reef to keep the algae under control before it gets out of control and you have a hideous mess, like I always complain about my frag system. My frag system could definitely use a very big, healthy cleanup crew. I, f I did a lot of cleaning on it before I went on vacation, and then I came home and... All the algae was back <laughs> and i'm just like uh and so yesterday i did some scraping of the the glass walls so i could see in the tank and i scooped out a whole bunch of algae that was blown around in the tank and i cleaned off the nero 5 pump uh, but ah, the tank is so frustrating 
Vince Loves Fish says, how long does it take for corals to bounce back? My Monty suffered heavily from phosphates bottoming out and magnesium being low. Uh, 12 weeks. <laughs> how do you like that? I have a solid answer for you. Not an if you do this or because of that. Just takes 12 weeks. Anytime something goes wrong in your tank, if you can correct it and get it back on track and maintain stability, in about 12 weeks, things will look normal and start improving again. So all you got to do is make sure it doesn't get any worse. And um, then, you know, you'll be like, look, it's looking so much better. Mark was right. It took three months. That's very common in this hobby. That is the, the, I think that's why I don't overreact. When things go wrong and something does go downhill or some kind of coloration is lost, I just look for the, the, the problem to find the solution. I apply the solution and I just, you know, mentally say, okay, in 12 weeks, this is going to look better. And that has been my mantra for so long. And it's always been true. One time I completely overdosed Prodibio, not knowing it was even possible because they state, I mean, all over their, their, uh, their uh, instructions, they say, you cannot overdose our product. Well, I found a way. And uh, I actually gave a Macna talk on it because, and they didn't mind. I did say to them, hey, you know, <laughs> this happened. They said, oh, give a talk about it. That's fine. We're fine with that. I'm like, all right. So, I, and they... I don't know if they sponsored the talk, but maybe they did. Maybe there was a sponsor of the talk too. And here I'm saying, I found a way to <laughs> overdose this product. But what had happened was I was putting the tank like normal, but I had a giant reactor filled with bio pellets. And the combination of Prodibio with the bio pellets, it just supercharged it. The bio pellets just melted away extremely quickly. Those bio pellets should have lasted. I mean, it was 2000 milliliters worth, which is a lot. And um, they should have lasted, you know, nine months, a year. And basically, in, I'd say three, four weeks, it was down to nothing. The reactor was completely empty. And my skimmer collection cup was really weird. I mean, what I was pulling out was like pudding. <laughs> Literally like pudding, not chocolate pudding, but pudding. It was so weird and rubbery that I thought, will this even go down the drain of my sink? Should I be throwing this in the trash? And I didn't understand what it was that was in the skimmer until I finally looked at the reactor and saw there was no beads in there. And at the same time that these two things were happening, everything that was green in my tank went brown. There was not one green thing in my tank. Hammers weren't green. Montipora wasn't green. Candy cane wasn't green. Everything lost its color. Uh, uh, Meteor shower cephastria wasn't green. It all lost its color. And uh, I had this huge, beautiful Monty that com turned completely brown. But I... I stopped dosing Prodibio entirely. Um, I blew off refilling the calcium, the, uh, I'm sorry, the biopot reactor. I just said, go back to basics, protein skimmer, uh, refugium. Uh, I'm sure I did a water change in there once and just leave the tank alone like I always do. And in about 12 weeks, you start seeing the leading edge of all those brown Monty's turning green. It was really neat. I was like, man, somebody would buy this because you had this brown Monty with a green lip and it looked really cool. And I had a meteor shower cephastria that had been green that was brown and it was kind of coming back blue. And I was like, oh, this is another unique coral people would wish they had in their tank all because of weird chemical reaction. So these things do happen and uh, you just have to wait 12 weeks. Uh, Reefer Madness says, I'd love to, I look forward to stopping by someday whenever I get a vacation. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going, but if it's south, I'd love to see the reef and probably buy some stuff too. That would be great. I'd appreciate that. And yeah, if people buy things and they want to pick up locally and not pay any shipping, they are welcome to do so. That's fine with me. And they do get an opportunity to see the reef tank. Um, Trevor, welcome to the live stream. <laughs> He says, I made one. I assume you miss most of them. And Christopher asks, do you use Kalkwasser? No, I don't. I've never felt the need to use it. Jaws Reef says, I'm a fan of Flatworm Stop. You know, let me Google it. <laughs> And look who sells it. Bulk Reef Supply has it for $126. Yeah, that is expensive. All right. I'll save that for later. 
Adam says, would you advise against using Kalkwasser in your auto top-off or your top-off reservoir? Yes, I do not recommend that at all. There was a guy who was local to me, nice guy, had a really nice reef, and he had a horrible incident. And he was just one of hundreds, if not a thousand, that had Kalkwasser overdoses. And he called me up and he was like, oh my God, my tank is completely milky white and everything is dying and I'm scooping out anything that's alive. I'm trying to save anything I can find as I reach into the milk and I hope to find a coral or I hope to catch a fish. And I said, well, what happened? You know, how did this go wrong? And he said that he had mixed up a new batch of Kalkwasser in his top off container. And I guess, I'm trying to remember exactly because this was years ago, but I do remember he went to dinner and when he came back, it was a disaster. And he was, you know, up late that night trying to salvage whatever he could. But I think what happened was he didn't have a siphon break. And so when the top off turned on and started trickling in his brand new batch of Kalkwasser, when the pump shut off, it just kept bringing more water in and adding more and more and more. And that is the risk. Something can go wrong with your top off. The other thing that you know, if you really think about it, and maybe you don't pay attention to it, but our tanks top off at different rates depending on the season. And you will have a time of the year where you only top off a little bit, and you have a time of year when your tank is thirsty as can be and needs to be topped off with water all the time, and your reef just consumes it. Um, I believe when the air is more humid, it tops off less, and when it's drier, you top off more. I think I have that correct. And if you are topping off an abundance of top off, you're topping off an abundance of Kalkwasser, which could put in way too much more than your tank needs. So I don't recommend it. I think it's just way too dangerous. I would much rather set up a small isolated system or container with a dosing pump that trickles in a fixed amount on a daily basis, and you mix up small batches of it so you can never accidentally put in way too much all at once. Raymond, thanks for commenting. <laughs> and this counts too. <laughs> I appreciate you watching the videos. Uh, Jason says, how soon, or yeah, do we get to see more of the new shop? How's the project going overall? It's been sitting stagnant. I am planning to, well, I'm hoping to get a little bit of work done on it tomorrow. And then uh, the middle of next week, I'm going to be aggressively attacking the next phase of that building so I can get into it finally. I just put it on hold. I wanted to just, I didn't like that customers were waiting for orders and I'm out there working on the building when I should be spending hours on their project. And you wanna see something I'm working on right now? So a customer ordered this giant tall container. This right here behind me, if I had built both, it would look like the Twin Towers, right? So what you're looking at is the top of a very large dosing container. There will be a John Guest bulkhead right here, and it will draw up solution from here with a dosing pump to dose the tank. And I don't even know how much this holds, but it's 30 inches tall. And uh, it'll have a lid on top. And the reason the opening is so big is because you want to be able to clean it out from time to time. And so I said, okay, you got it. So I did that, I've been working on it. He wants two of them. And uh, the, the way they're designed, they will sit side by side, but they're not identical. So the top of this one, you saw the hole with a little John Guest fitting. And then the other one will have the hole with the John Guest fitting here. So that way the two are near each other, near the two dosing pumps. And uh, so I've got the second one on the table. I've started gluing it and I'm going to get rid of that. And then I have four more to do for someone you got, many of you know that's going to be shipped down south in here in Texas. And I've got a frag tank to build, and I've got um, a very special set of power brake holders that someone asked for probably a month ago. And I got those cut out. Those are ready to glue that will hold the big power supplies for the Radions as well as the smaller power supplies that many of our other products use. And so you need the super brick holder. And so I've got a couple of those on the table. And uh, those are just a few off the top of my head. I, I have about 21 people pending at all times. 
And whenever someone new comes in, they go to the bottom of the list and I just keep working my way up and I try to whittle them down as much as I can. And I did a whole bunch before my vacation. I came back, I was kind of exhausted, I was emotionally drained and uh, I had to take a day off this week to just do nothing and I literally did nothing. I just said, today is Sunday, even though it wasn't. I just said, today is my Sunday and I did nothing and just kind of relaxed because I came back from my trip and immediately started working and then I had the live stream and the following day I had the all day uh, trade show that I mentioned to you guys we had here in Fort Worth and I just hadn't had any time off. You'd think the vacation was time off, but you're with family and if you know anything about family, which many of you do, it's not always really relaxing. I mean, there's certain things that are nice, but it is a little stressful. You're not in your home just doing your own thing. You're, you're, it's just tiring. And uh, plus the long drive each direction for me. So it was, um, I needed a day off and I took it. So I'm back to it, but I would love to get in the building. I would love to get everything that's in this house into the building. So I just have a lot of open space in here. And then I would like to start really, I say aggressively because I mean it, <laughs> just finish all these half done everything's around me that are just plaguing me. I just, I have to kind of just, I mean, I see it all around me. I see things that are not done all the time. And then I have a whole list of things I need to do. You know, I want to build the stand for the new um, anemone cube. Those anemones are still waiting. The clowns are still waiting. I want to get the woodwork done on this tank. I want to get the rest of these walls painted like they were supposed to have been done. I want to paint all the ceilings in the entire house. Uh, I've got baseboard that I purchased that's ready to nail on the wall. I need to cut out all those pieces and put them down here around the brand new tile floors. So there's lots of that to do. Um, there's so much to do. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And you know what? I don't, I'm at the point now where it's like, I will just have to work on it. I'm going to have to look at my home once I'm in that building. I mean, that will help immensely, but I'm gonna have to look at this home as like a flip project. You know, people will buy a house and they, they want to fix it up so they can flip it. And I'm gonna have to look at this as a flip and basically uh, work all week. And then on my weekends, work on the house until I get the house done. And then I can just enjoy it. And um, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I realize it's on the horizon and it's just, uh, I need longer hours. I need a longer day or less sleep. 29 hour day, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, did I miss a comment earlier from Aftershock? I don't understand why you're bringing this up. I feel like there's a part of this, or I, was there something I said first? But Aftershock said, my local fish store has said that he has been reported multiple times for taking in people's fish and giving them store credit. He's no longer doing the service. Uh, is this really not allowed? There's nothing illegal about that. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, starting to understand. I felt like there was more to this. You're asking, is this a real thing? No, I've never heard of that. Not once. There, There's no reporting of anyone for having fish go to a store. I don't even understand where they came up with that. Kenny says, I'm from Scotland. How are you liking your Neptune skies? I love them. I think they're great. I... Um, I considered putting a sky over the anemone cube, but I own a light fixture already that works perfectly fine with them. So there's really no reason to spend that money on an extra fixture. So instead I just sell them. <laughs> so they're available in my shop. I have two in my inventory right now. I'll stick this on the screen again. Um, if you would like to buy a Neptune sky, they are $870. And uh, I have those in stock. I also have the single arm with the connector if you wanted to clip it onto the edge of a rimless tank. And I also sell the hanging kit if you wanted to use the stainless steel cables to hang it down from the ceiling. So if that's something you're interested in, you can reach out to me. You can purchase from the website. Just let me know. <laughs> I mentioned naked 20 minutes ago. I'm finally seeing the comments. You guys are hilarious. Trevor says, hope you're well. What are your thoughts of Randy leaving BRS? Shock, I didn't even hear about that. How did I not hear about that? Where did you hear that? What did I miss? 
Uh, Dave says, what is your opinion on Vibrant? I actually talked about this last week. I have no opinion. I've never used it. I didn't know that it was a questionable product. You know, I just never had a, a feeling for it, period. And um, people have been asking me about Vibrant for years. Or they'd say, how do you use it? And I'm like, I don't know. Ask somebody that uses it. But I don't have an opinion. So all I've been hearing is that it's... Um, all I've been hearing, the rumor, is that some people have been analyzing it and saying it's exactly like the API LG side and uh, rebottled under a different name, maybe for more money. I don't know. So it sounds like there's some accusations of being lied to, and we'll have to see how it all settles out. Oh, thank you, Aftershock. It's sunny over here, too. If I could swing that camera, you'd see a very bright, sunny day. Our temperature today is going to be 77 for the high. And, you know, just 10 days ago, we were down in the 20s. So it's crazy about Texas. I bought a bunch of roses to plant in the backyard. Um, that was something Caitlin loved. And I've had them waiting for the weather to warm up. And they are growing. And there's one that has a rose bud ready to open up. I'm like, oh, my God, I haven't put you in the ground yet. You're already flowering. So I got to dig holes um, ASAP, I guess this week. One more thing to do. John says, I have a Blue Ridge in my tank right now, and I've had it for 15 years. See? Yeah, Blue Ridge is not that easy to come by. There may be some companies that sell it, but it cannot be harvested from the ocean. It's a protected coral. So getting your hands on some is kind of cool. Um, I actually had one person specifically ask me about that coral on one of my videos. And he kept saying, what is that, you know, over your shoulder at 11 minutes? And I'm like, what is he talking about? And we went back and forth with like four or five messages on YouTube until finally he was talking about that one right there. And he said he loved the structure and the way it's growing. And the more he mentioned it, the more I was like, yeah, it is really cool the way it's growing. <laughs> For me, it's just, a, it's just a coral that's not crazy interesting, but he actually was fascinated with it. And his fascination kind of made me more fascinated with it again. Now, the one thing it's never done, and which I wish it would do, would put out all these like white polyps off of its brown, shiny skin. And it can do that, but I've never seen it do it in my tanks ever. But I saw, I was visiting a fish store in um, Louisiana, and they had this giant coral in the back of the tank, and it was covered, it looked covered in snow. I was like, what is that thing? And they said Blue Ridge, and I was like, no way that's Blue Ridge, because I have Blue Ridge, it's never done that. So mine isn't like the one that I saw in Louisiana, but I'd love to see it do that one day. The most I've ever seen come out of that coral are like hairs, like filaments, and they're almost invisible. You have to really be looking. But what I saw in Louisiana was like polyps coming out. It was crazy, and they would really move. It was really, really cool. Uh, the nice thing about Blue Ridge that is unique compared to other corals is that it goes through different cycles. And it actually has a cycle where it sheds like a leather coral does, where it throws off some skin. But when it does that shedding, the coral looks super crazy shiny. And you're looking at it in the tank and you're like, it looks like it's wet. <laughs> That's the best way I can describe it. It's fascinating. And then other times it just kind of looks honey brown. But when it's shiny, you know, people are like, man, what is that thing? That's really neat. So it is kind of fun to talk about things that have been around so long that you're so blasé about, and then someone kind of reawakens your excitement about it and gets you all interested again. Lee says, is carbon dosing still recommended to help control nitrate, or are there better options these days in addition to water changes? No, it's very active. <laughs> Carbon dosing is almost the one thing people do. And I do believe that people are carbon dosing way before they need to. I think because we have such a plethora of gear these days, everyone installs everything from the beginning of their tank and they get it all set up because they're afraid something will happen later. And because they've put all so early, the tank actually doesn't thrive. It kind of struggles and stumbles along and, you know, the person sees an issue and they're like, I need to kill the diatoms. And, and then they see a hint of cyano. I got to kill the cyano. And then they see a hint of hair algae. And they're like, I got to use Vibrant. And, you know, it's like too much overreaction on tanks that have to go through the ugly phase. There, the common misconception is that you cannot have an ugly phase. That you, you can use all these solutions and never have to deal with it. And it's, it's bad information. It's bad advice. 
So if someone says, hey, my tank, my rock that I bought, it was bone white when I put it in the tank, and now it's orange, why is it like that? Why? And then people say, don't worry, it'll turn green, it'll turn red, and like, I don't want any of that to happen. And then the people say, well, take it out and put it in vinegar, or do this or do that. Like, no, let it go through the crazy colors. Give it four or five months to go through those phases. Make sure you add a cleanup crew after a few months and let them start eating the algae that's starting to develop. And, you know, if you see diatoms, diatoms are okay. They're a food source for bacteria. They will also go away on their own. There's a lot of things that take care of themselves. And then there are certain issues that, are, that get big and bad and out of control, and you have to tackle it. But I feel like using all these things, including carbon dosing, just on brand new young tanks is um, hindering the success and uh, I feel like everything has a time just like I grew up with my father my father did not work with tools okay um, he did a little bit but then he really hated it but he said to me always use the right tool for the you know for the right job don't just grab you know, a wrench and use it like a hammer and uh, don't use needle nose pliers to like take a bolt off your engine you know that kind of stuff you want to use the right tool for the job to be successful and it's not even a matter of the right tool, but it's also when to use that tool. And so there are times where we need to let, just sit back and enjoy the tank for what it is. I've been helping a, a hobbyist in New Jersey, and his tank is actually doing really, really well. And he said, well, what can I do now? I was like, nothing. Enjoy it. Things will go bad again. Don't worry. <laughs> just enjoy the time off, the, the lack of stress, the ability to just see things doing well every day and just have to clean the glass a little bit and put in more food. I mean, how nice is that? And then, you know, if you want to fine tune something, you know, you want to improve the way your tank is topping off, you can do that. But leave the tank alone. Just let it do its thing. Let the corals grow out and fill in and, and become more and more lush. And uh, I think that we tinker a little too much. And I'm hoping that the Reef Diary kind of helped you guys appreciate that with my tank. Yeah, I was dealing with some stuff, but then I also was at a point where I wasn't. And I remember there were some Reef Diaries where I just said, I did nothing today. I didn't even have to clean the glass. It was fantastic. And uh, I took some pictures. <laughs> so that is the way it should be. We should not be stressing over our tank every single day trying to fix a problem. I think sometimes we need to just leave it alone. Uh, Protex Remodeling says, how's the shop coming along? Nothing, but uh, I am going to have some guys out here soon to put some tile in the front, um, the big, huge sidewalk patio that's in front. Unfortunately, when I had them pour the concrete, I made the mistake of um, saying just pour a solid slab, and I did not let them slope the front. And they said, well, don't you want us to slope that? And this is a big mistake. I was like, no, it's fine. And they said, aren't you worried about rain? I'm like, no, I'm not worried about rain. You made it flat. What could happen? Well, <laughs> what do you think is happening? The rain hits it and it works its way into the wall and goes through the building. So I'm gonna have some tile work done on the outside to slope the tile away from the building to pull the moisture away. And it'll look good too. So, I mean, that part's nice. <laughs> Jason says, how about Jack's diary series? You know, that could be uh, interesting because she is quite the character. I do appreciate that almost always she's really good for the live streams. She sees me setting up this entire room that I'm in right now. And uh, here, let me take a picture of what I'm looking at and show y'all. So we'll do this. And then... This is what I'm looking at. I know it's a little blurry. But um, when she sees me putting all this stuff out here, she just stays in the bedroom and is essentially quiet unless something really interesting happens in, in the front yard and she sees it through the window. But I, I'm glad. Um, she did scare the heck out of me a couple of days ago. I had just taken her for a walk around the block. And, you know, we go all the way around. You know, she does her business. And then we come in. I take off her, her uh, harness and her leash. And she just goes straight for the back door. She, has, she wants to go out again. I'm like, really? We just were out there for 30 minutes. So I opened the back door and I let her out. And I went to go use the restroom. And a few minutes later, I came back to the back door and I was, and I opened the door to call her because I didn't, you know, either she's waiting at the door or she's investigating something. And she wasn't at the door and she wasn't investigating. She was 
on the concrete, and this was at night, the temperature outside was probably 50s, 60s, and she was lying on the concrete, her legs straight out in front of her instead of like, whatever, it was weird. And I've never seen her do that, and I thought, oh my God, did a neighbor poison her? Did they put something out there in the yard and she ate it? Did an animal attack her? And she didn't even want to get up. She was just lying there on this concrete at night, not in the sun baking like dogs like to do, where they like to bask. And it was really odd, and I was worried about her. And, you know, after a few minutes, she decided to get up. And I was like, don't do that to me. My heart can't take it. Hi, Mike. Uh, Raymond says, do you do automatic water changes? No, I do not. I, am, uh, I have trust issues. <laughs> I just do water changes now, Raymond says it made his life so much simpler. I believe you. Please do keep in mind, even with automatic water changes, it's very important for you to double check your salinity every single week. So I don't know what you've got set up. You already automated your water change. I don't know if you have other automation on your tank, but to grab a water sample and verify it on a refractometer would be very important to make sure your salinity does not wander from these automatic water changes. Gabe says, I'm installing a new 180 gallon tank. Would you put the sump in the basement? Any pros and cons you can think of? I keep on thinking about having to go into the basement if I need to do anything. Well, I think the pro is that you have a lot more space in the basement than you will under the tank itself. And a lot of people that have basements can do that and enjoy it. I have never lived in a house that had a basement, so I don't even have the, the opportunity to consider it. But it would be really nice to have lots of room for mixing salt water, doing water changes, spills happen down there. You don't really care as much, I would think, as you would in your living room. Uh, you can set up dosing pumps and electrical panels with all your gear set up all nicely on the wall with cable management. I mean, you can make it quite the, quite the visual eye candy for the gearhead. You know, it could be really cool looking. Uh, You'll need a pump that can overcome the head pressure of pushing back upstairs. Uh, you may have the sound of water coming down, like crashing down into the sump of the basement. Uh, there are, I'm sure there are plumbing hacks to make it plumb just right so it's not so noisy. But uh, I can't really think of a lot of cons other than, like you said, you have to go down in the basement. I would think if you're going to put a sump in the basement, I would set up a wise camera or two to where you can open up your phone and just see what's happening in the basement so you don't have to walk down there and look. Um, I think that would be an important one to do. Um, I would be a person that uses uh, the Apex controller with Apex Fusion to keep track of a lot of things like flow rates and, and see how much is in a reservoir, you know, with your dosing to make sure you don't run out of certain solutions because when it's out of sight, out of mind, it's, it's easier to ignore things than when it's right in front of you. So maybe those are cons, <laughs> but uh, I, th I think it's great to be able to put all that stuff downstairs and just have, you know, the things you need under the tank that would be like maybe tubing for uh, vacuuming the sand bed or put all your test kits, you know, or the f dry fish foods or extra lighting bulbs or, you know, I say lighting because <laughs> uh, everyone has LEDs that last forever. But I mean, there's just certain things, you know, flashlights and things you like to use, the sponges and brushes, all those can be under the tank because you don't have a sump taking up all that space. So, I mean, there would be that kind of benefit. USO says, I bought the Salifert iodine test kit and I'm not getting any color at all. After the test, should I dose iodine until I do? No, um, iodine <clears throat> and iodate get consumed rapidly and iodide, there's three of them. They get, con it gets used up really fast in our water. And the problem is if you overdose it, you can really f cause some, some stress to your fish. And they'll be gasping. I mean, it, you don't want to overdose iodine. It's very important not to do that. I would suggest, I know you own a test kit, but I think this is one of those ones where I would rely on an ICP test to give you the most accurate iodine test result. And that way you could see what that number is to see if you need to dose. And that way you don't accidentally hurt your livestock by overdosing iodine. It's one of those ones you do not want to overdose. 
Sully says, any thoughts on blotched antheists? Yeah, they're awesome, especially when they're babies. When they're big, they're kind of ugly. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the case with some fish in this hobby. I've always wanted one of those. I think they're, they're fantastic, but I want little tiny ones. And uh, I remember coming across them on one of my trips to Arizona, and I went to visit a fish store while I was in the state. And I was like, ah, oh, let me just go see what they have. And they had them on sale at 100 bucks a piece, which was a deal back then. And I was like, how am I going to get these home alive? There's, there's no way. I can't do it. And I hated walking away from that deal. And I've never seen anything close to that price. And now it's even worse. <clears throat> uh, Manuel says, my spongiotis, which is a type of Montipora, is growing white. Is that normal? When, it, when I got it, it was green. Keep up the great work. Very helpful. No, white is not normal. The leading edge might look a little pale but the coral itself should not be pale. You want to make sure you have plenty of mont uh, <laughs> Start to say the dumb thing. You want to have plenty of magnesium in the tank for the Montipora, and perhaps you're running the lights too much intensity too long, and it's bleaching out that coral in your tank. Uh, what you can do for now is, you, if possible, you could move it all the way down to the sand bed and see if it does better with less light intensity. Make sure your magnesium is around 1400 and hope it colors up again. John says, do you run a calcium reactor? And if so, which one? Yes, I've been running a calcium reactor, the same calcium reactor since 2004. It's made by Life Reef. Um, I think it's something like VS24 because it's 24 inches tall. And I have fixed it a few times. I have re replaced the pump on it a few times. And it has been through multiple tanks over the years. Like I said, I've had it, God, 18 years. <laughs> That's a long time. So um, there's a whole article about the calcium reactor on my website where I explain everything about it and how I operate it and how you should set one up. So you can definitely check that out. I also have a video on this channel about calcium reactors that I finally did one day. And the one reactor I showed was from Aquamax and I still haven't known hooked it up. It was gonna be on the other tank and I just never got around to it. So when I reset that tank, which has been on my hit list for years, when I finally do it, it will be set up with that calcium reactor to maintain my numbers. What I'm gonna do, um, I've already mentally put this on my list. I'm going to replace that tank that's it's four feet long. I'm gonna make it shorter, so it's a smaller tank. It'll still be a frag system, but uh, I'll have a small quarantine tank next to it on the same stand. And that way I've got the benefit of quarantine as well as my frag system. And the quarantine will be standalone. It'll be all in one. It won't have any kind of external anything. It'll just be light and, and some kind of a filter. And um, it'll have a heater, of course. But it's going to be very simple because I need to be able to completely clean it out in case anything does get into it where it cannot get into the frag system or into the sump or any of that. It, won't, it will not be sharing filtration with the frag system. Uh, ATF says, I can send you a picture of my tanks with lots of colorful, unusual, soft stuff. Actually, why don't you post those in Club Miller's Reef? Here, I'm going to drag this. I think I'm going to drag it. Oh, it's locked. Hang on. I'm drag it to the other side of the screen so it's not on top of my face. One day you'd think I'd have a graphic that has it all together as one piece. I never get around to it. All right. So, um, Club Miller's Reef is a group I created on Facebook a... Uh, Almost four years ago, we have over 9,000 members and we share our tanks there. The group was created specifically for YouTubers, you know, for everyone here on the YouTube channel to share their tanks and ask questions and share video with me. And I designed it as an area where we can all talk to each other without being made fun of or put down. We have uh, six or eight moderators, including myself, that make sure there's peaceful everything all the time. We uh, have a set of rules. It's a video, of course, that tells you how to behave in the group. It's very simple. I just tell you to be nice to other people. And I'd spend five minutes saying that. <laughs> but um, it's really important that we treat others nicely and don't make them feel bad when they have to ask a question. When I ask a question, I don't want someone making fun of me. And so I've always felt like we should have the ability to have a group where we can communicate effectively with one another, ask questions, get answers, be helpful, and, you know, I've seen it in other groups where they're just so mean. And, you know, like someone will come on and say, hey, what is this in my tank? And then one of the people that's been in this group a long time that would say, 
oh, this has been posted a thousand times. Don't you know how to Google? And it's like, you're just being mean. You don't have to be mean. Just scroll past it. Just don't say anything at all. And so we created a group called Club Me Loves Reef. And that group has uh, lots of good people in there. And I would love to see pictures of your tanks in there. So if you haven't posted a picture of your tank like uh, uh, ATF had offered, then what I would say is many of you should post some pictures of your tank this week so I can see how yours is doing as well. And I'll stick some fresh pictures of my tank in there as well this week. So we'll have a nice thread. Chris says, thanks for getting those lights out so quickly. You're very welcome. Let's see. Uh, Extra Cargo says, thank you for your wisdom. Seems like what we get at the local fish store is mixed knowledge. Some good, some not so good. I appreciate your review from someone we can trust. Listen, I have been to so many fish stores over the last 25 years. I've been to stores that were horrible. I've been to stores that are great. I've been to stores that seemed really good, but then I heard them giving out bad advice. I mean, I'm sure there's people out there that say I give bad advice. You know, I mean, it just, everyone's got an opinion, right? The bottom line is, you have to basically listen to everyone and then filter out the noise, get down to the, the essence of the answer and decide is it a, an answer you can live with? Is it something that makes sense to you? And that's what I always did. I, when I would ask for you know help with my tanks back in the early 2000s, I would also look at the person, the person giving the advice, I'd look at their tank and see what their tank looks like. And when I saw their reef, then I could decide, do I believe them? Do I want to listen to them? And I wasn't just like immediately saying, absolutely no way, this guy's terrible because their tank didn't look good. If their tank just had a crash and he lost a lot of stuff, that, wouldn't be a, a, that would not be a fair judgment of that person. But if I'm reading their advice and I'm reading some of their other comments they've made in other threads on other topics, and it just overall they seem like a reasonable, general, helpful person, I'm already listening. And I look at their tank, and the tank looks good. I'm like, all right, it seems like someone I'd like to emulate. And that's kind of where I would decide who was worthy, uh, someone that I would trust. And I read articles, I read books, I went to Macna, I talked to people in person, I asked questions, I listened to stories. And all of that kind of shaped me for the person I am, and, it, and I've continued to share that knowledge. I mean, I, I've never been able to not share knowledge it's something I've done my entire life. And I've done it from a very early age all the way to now. If I learn something, I immediately post about it to help someone else so that it makes their life a little bit easier too. And that was the whole point of this channel. That was the whole point of YouTube with live streams was so we could answer questions and get you some answers so that way you could move forward and have a successful reef tank and enjoy it and not be stressed out about it. <clears throat> uh, Omar says, can Alveopora touch a plate coral? I don't think so. I think the plate coral may be a little too aggressive. And speaking of Alveopora, I saw some for sale at that event last weekend. And I didn't buy it. I wanted to buy it, but I didn't buy it because they were small. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Alveopora is an LPS coral. It usually has like a branch, like a frog spawn or a hammer coral, and then you have this beautiful explosion of polyps coming off of it. And what I saw looked like, I mean, I didn't touch it. I didn't even poke it with a stick. You know, I'm just looking in the tank. What I saw were square frag plugs with these polyps that were definitely alveopora, but they were so close to it, my brain was thinking it's just skin on top of ceramic with some polyps. And I didn't want to buy that. I wanted to buy a coral that had a skeletal base. Now, maybe there was more skeletal base underneath, but what I was seeing looked like nothing. I mean, it was too close to the tile for me to feel comfortable with it, to feel like it'll grow successfully. So I passed on it. I realized we can't buy the things I used to buy back in the day. Things have just changed that much. But Alveopora is a really pretty coral. It has a really unique head and... Uh, the, the polyp structure is just so cool looking. It's actually more interesting to me to, than a Goniopora, or at least the general Goniopora. But um, I don't think it'll do well in your coral or, or a Heliophungia. I think those things would sting it. So anyway, most 
usually the best practice when it comes to corals is to put space between all of them. And that way, as they grow in, you can see how they interact with each other. And you can see if there are skirmishes or if they're peaceful. And if they uh, brush up against each other and you don't see any kind of incident, you can feel okay with it. And if you start to see, like, for example, I bought a sun coral and I put it in a spot over here that's right behind those dendros that I'm pointing at. And I was like, okay, that looks like a decent spot. And I didn't secure it because it's sun corals. But I looked at it yesterday and the hammers are brushing it and burning off the skin. So I got to move it. It's just not the right spot. But I, it hasn't even opened up yet. I have, I've been looking at it every single day. They, they're, the skin is puffing up, but they're not opening up into the little flowers they're supposed to be. And uh, so I want to get them off of that contact with another nearby coral immediately so that way they can start to open up so I can start feeding them so they can live and be pretty. Hillbilly, Hillbilly Reefer says, I have too many Aptasia in too many places for F Aptasia. Uh, too many are up under the rocks to apply it. The SPS dominated tank. <clears throat> the Aptasia sting the corals and are stressed from low nutrients and high alkalinity. All right. Well, uh, there are other pro there's a thing on the market for 400 bucks right now you could buy. <laughs> uh, the new UV thing. Um, Reef Delete. Is a new product. Uh, Mr. Saltwater Tank did a video about it on saltwateraquarium.com's YouTube channel, and you can watch. And basically, you're holding this device in the water and pointing it at the subject, and you hold down the button, and you basically irradiate it with UV for like a whole minute before you move to the next spot. And it's much slower than the lasers that we did a few years ago. And um, I don't know what the final verdict was on that one, but I've seen one video or two videos of it in use. I need to see if he's uh, done a, a final opinion follow-up on that product yet. But it's 400 bucks. But you can get everywhere you want in your tank from every angle, and you can start zapping them. You can use the uh, nudibranchs. You can use the peppermint shrimp and, um, and uh, the copper band butterfly. I mean... These are all things that can help, but none of them are like guaranteed to eradicate them entirely. They just pick at them because that is their preferred choice. Doesn't mean that's the only thing they'll eat until there's none left. It's, uh, that's the hard part of this hobby. There's no absolutes in anything. Uh, Sharks 3D Man says, my alkalinity drops a lot every day. <clears throat> I have 165 gallon water volume after the rocks. I dose 100 milliliters per day and it still drops. I saw online that Microbacter 7 and Live Rock Enhance could be the cause, but after, and uh, there's more. I stopped using it and it's still dropping. Give any advice. My tank is not super grown out. <clears throat> kind of like your reset with most of those corals that size. Um, when you're dosing the alkalinity, are you using a dosing pump and is it trickling in slowly? Is it dosing directly into the tank or is it dosing into your sump? Those are some things I need answers to before I can start helping you. Um, I do not believe that Microbacter 7 or Live Rock Enhance would affect or slow down the ability of dosing alkalinity into your tank. Alkalinity is something we dose every single day. We should dose it in the morning during the low pH period of your, uh, your daily reef keeping endeavors. And we want to dose it slowly very slowly into the tank we don't want it to go in in one you, know, you don't want to just take it and go boop and just dump it in it has to trickle in slowly uh, 100 milliliters a day seems like a lot but it doesn't sound like too much but you're saying you're putting it in and the numbers are dropping now you also said it drops a lot you didn't say how much it drops or yeah i need real numbers i need to know what the alkaline was supposed to be and I need to know what the alkaline was the next day. And let's just find out what those numbers are. And also, how are you testing it? Are you following the graph from the Trident, for example? Because sometimes that thing just trends down and we can't seem to correct the problem. So let's kind of figure out, I need more detail before I can help you. Uh, Ritesh says, your aquarium is looking good. Thank you. I have a Hannah Salinity checker and it reads one part lower. Uh, what is affecting its conductivity? Will it read differently in another tank? It's properly calibrated. 
I don't understand what you mean by one part lower. One part lower than what? Than a refractometer, than a swing arm hydrometer? You know, what are we comparing it against? Uh, you can always contact Hannah directly and see if they have any tips or suggestions. If you had a second body of water, like a brand new batch of salt water you can use for water change, you could then measure that to do a comparison and see. But the bottom line is if, let's just say it is measuring one part lower, like one PPT lower. Like let's say your tank is 35, but it's measuring 34. And, you're, and you measure your salt water that you're gonna do the water change with, and it measures 34. Well, even though the meter might not be telling you the absolute truth, the tank water and the new water have the same number. And as long as they have the same number, you can safely do your water change. Andrea says, no pencil urchins. You heard her, everyone. No pencil urchins. Scott says, is Spock a male or a female? As I have a NASA, but it has long fins on its tail, and it's hard to see if Spock has them too. You know, I think Spock continues to be a girl. For a while there, I thought she was transitioning to a boy because there was a long streamer on the bottom, but the top stayed short. The male would have long streamers, and it never happened. So I don't know what the deal is, but for the most part, she tends to look like a girl all the time. Rob, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. I'm going to buy some more bananas for Spock. Um, <clears throat> Reefer Madness says, what kind of friendly fish eat algae from the rocks and eat large zootoplankton? <laughs> Um, there's not a lot of fish that just consume algae all the time. Uh, the lawnmower blenny can nip at it. The coal tang can nip at it. Some tangs can nip at it. Um, some people like to convert freshwater mollies to saltwater to eat algae. So you've got that as a choice. But, um... I can't think of any other fish. Oh, fox face. That's another algae consumer. You know, anything that is a herbivore fish would be something that may work on algae in the tank and, you know, nip it off of the rocks. Yay, Marcus's Reef says, I got my smart store in the mail yesterday. A welcomed addition to my testing reefing collection. You're going to love that thing. I used it yesterday. I used it today. I mean, it's awesome. And I'm always surprised at how long the battery lasts in it. I mean, you just never seem to have to charge it. I, I feel like I charge it once every two months. Also, by the way, in case you lose the bead, I got more beads in for the magnetic stirrer. So if it comes up, I have them in stock. And because it's like a grain of rice, I can mail it in an envelope for the price of a stamp, as far as I'm concerned. Let's see. Um, Rick says, my copper band ate my urchins. Urchins are great at keeping the rocks super clean. You know, I um, put 11 urchins in this tank, and the most I ever counted at one time was nine. Uh, last week, I found one urchin shell in my rock work, and I was like, ah. But that means I should still have 10 roaming the tank, and I have not seen 10. I've also not seen the copper band go after mine, but... I'm not going to say it couldn't happen. It's possible. But uh, I would like to find 10 in my tank. <laughs> I don't like losses. Soves Borg says, keeping coral is easy. Ick, death is my eternal problem. How do you do it? Well, I, um, I don't have to deal with ick in my tank. I never have. I also don't go out buying fish all the time. And when I do buy a fish, I put it through safety stop. Uh, I have in the past put fish through quarantine tanks and didn't always have much success with that, even though that is the preferred and recommended approach. It just, and I'm not the only guy to say that. There's a lot of guys that have been in the hobby a long time that they put a beautiful fish they bought in quarantine. You know, the tank's supposed to be good for them and the fish just dies in there. But if they put the fish in their reef, it lives. And, you know, it, the difference between a quarantine tank and your reef is completely different. They, you know, the reef has everything. The quarantine tank is barren. 
it may have a hiding spot and it has an air stone or has a little bit of filtration. It's just not the same environment. And uh, I remember I would uh, quarantine a bunch of antheas. I tried quarantining copper bands. I tried different fish and it just didn't work. But I put my reef and they always lived. So when Safety Stop came to market back probably in 2009, I was so excited by this product because it was a rapid fish bath to get rid of external parasites. Now it doesn't deal with internal parasites and that's an important one because if you buy a fish that has internal parasites, when it poops, that poop goes in the water column and another fish eats it and now they have internal parasites and you can spread the disease through all your healthy fish. So we, you know, buying fish, you have to be really judicious. You have to decide, is it worth the risk? And, you know, it was really funny. Many, many years ago, my dad was leaking my reef tank. He'd come here uh, to Fort Worth and he saw my tank in person and he says, where are all the fish? And I was like, what do you mean? They're right there. And he said, well, you have a lot of coral and it's like you decorate the tank with a few fish. I'm like, right. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> and he just thought that was really strange. You know, now my dad had a tank when I was a kid and he had fish in it and he had an octopus and he had an anemone and he had all these different things. So it's not like he doesn't know anything. He did. He did those things when I was a little kid. But um, yeah, I'm all about corals. I'm not about getting fish and I'm definitely not. I, I don't go to places to rescue fish. Like I don't go to Petco and see a sick fish and think, well, I'm going to get it and save it because that is just like bringing the plague home to my house. I don't want to get a fish from a vendor that has sick fish. And if they have sick fish that apparently are tied to the same sump as the coral system, I don't even want to buy corals or cleanup crew. You know, everything has to be isolated. The fish are in fish tanks and the corals are in coral tanks and the cleanup crews are in the cleanup tank. I can shop that way. But I do look at all the health of the fish in a fish store before I buy anything. And, um... Also keep in mind that you may have fish that actually are carrying ick on them. There's ick in the system, but there's no display of it because everyone's immune system is uh, warding it off. But if something really goes wrong with your tank, there's a huge temperature spike or a temperature drop, or there's an alkalinity spike, or there's an overdose of vitamin C or potassium or some nutty thing, you could suddenly see fish break out an ick that you haven't even put a new fish in your tank in six months. And why do you suddenly have fish with ick? That can happen. One of my friends, he constantly was dealing with ick all the time, and I felt bad, I mean, because I couldn't help him get over it. And what he ended up doing was he broke down the entire tank. He wiped down everything with vinegar water. He, uh, I think he put all his rocks through vinegar water. I mean, he just wanted to bleach everything. <laughs> and then he set it up brand new. And um, I think he did something with the fish as well. And he finally put the ick to bed. And he did a video about it. It's on his YouTube channel. But um, yeah, it was it was really frustrating for him. And I felt bad. I, I couldn't see how anyone could have that much problem with ick. And you sound like another one of these guys that's really struggling with it. So all I can do is say, I hope that you find a solution that works for you. And once you've got your system ick free, I wouldn't put anything else in that could mess that up. So it stays ick free. Uh, Sharks 3D said, by the way, all my test values are spot on except for alkalinity being low. Calcium levels keep climbing. I'm not dosing them to 600. You know what? I wonder if you are dosing calcium and not alkalinity accidentally. Either the dosing pump or the solutions got mixed because you're watching calcium keep going up, but you're not dosing it and you're watching alkalinity drop even though you're dosing a bunch of alkalinity. Maybe that's what's happened. It may be uh, something got cross-pollinated there in your system, in your setup. So what you could do is get rid of the liquid. You know, it's just funny. I won't do it, okay? But when you have clear liquid, clear liquid, clear liquid, I can't just like take my finger and put it in there and taste and say, that's alkalinity, <laughs> that's calcium, that's magnesium. But you could test the solution for alkalinity, for calcium, for magnesium to identify what's what. I mean, it's possible, but it's concentrated. So you're gonna go through a lot of a test kit trying to figure it out. I remember once testing my mixed alkalinity and I used a ton of the test kit to do it. 
like, you know, normally when I test alkalinity for my tank, I need 16 to 18 drops. And I might have used 200 drops <laughs> to measure the alkalinity of liquid alkalinity I'd mixed up. So maybe you've just got those backwards. Hi, Kayla. Good job taking care of Pal's tank while he was away. And uh, stop yelling at me. Uh, Alex says, is there a limit on how many hermit crabs and snails I can put in my tank? Um, well, I like to say one per gallon. So you can put more. You can put way too many. I, I've told the story before, and I, it, I just feel like it's a great story. And some people are new to the channel. They've not heard it. So I had ordered in a bunch of cleaner crew for myself and for four other systems in my local area. And I was getting us a huge deal on a group buy, so that way everyone saved money. And then one person said, oh, I don't need any of it. I bought some other stuff myself. <laughs> After I'd placed the order. So I had tons of cleanup crew. And uh, my tank is 60 gallons, the, the frag system. And I put in like 600 critters in there. And the next day, that tank was clean. <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. And I was like, wow. If you ever want to just completely clean a tank, just overload it with cleanup crew. It's fantastic. But then, of course you have 600 creatures that are looking for food and there's not nearly enough. And you really couldn't feed enough to keep them all healthy. You need to get them to other homes as quickly as possible so they don't die off, um, which is what I did. I, I dispersed them quickly as best I could, but it was amazing to watch that tank just completely um, morph overnight as these ravidly hungry creatures that arrived, you know, just went to town and just devoured the tank. It was awesome. Uh, Rick says, is a tank going in the new building? If not, do you think you'll miss seeing the tank while we're getting... No, this is not moving. Uh, the building is for work. Uh, it literally is going to be, I am going to work. My commute will be far. I will have to step like 20 steps to get there. Um, and uh, I already have one thing that's going in the building. <clears throat> it's an important thing. I got me this. <laughs> so this will be in the new building to keep me company. Company, And when I'm thirsty, I can just brew up a nice cup of coffee or hot chocolate or tea or whatever it is. I'll probably use the, um, the pods you can fill yourself so I'm not adding to the landfills. But I have a coffee maker here in the kitchen. And I was thinking, am I really going to go back and forth every time my mug is low to refill my coffee cup? And then I got this Keurig that was given to me, brand new in the box. Um, and I was like, yes, I will take that. So that is going in the new building. I'm excited about that. I'll probably also put a little tiny fridge in there for like some drinks. But will I miss the tank? No, because when I'm done working, I will come here into my home and enjoy my reef. And my living room will feel like a living room with a reef tank and not like a business. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. I feel like it's going to... Be like a weight off my shoulders because I can just kind of decompress and not have something I've got to glue in front of me reminding me that I should be doing that instead of watching TV or eating dinner or going to bed. <laughs> you know, I'm really looking for, and matter of fact, I told you these dosing containers that I'm making, that kind of order where the person wanted four of these really large containers is exactly why I need multiple build stations so I can work on them all at once and not have to do one and get it out of the way to start number two. I mean, there's only so much room on this table and this uh, building would have been perfect for that order. So that's why I'm like, why am I not in my building yet? <laughs> so frustrating, but I'll get there. Um, I do need to mention, <sighs> let me double check before I say it wrong. So my club, is um, we just had a booth at the Coral Show last weekend. And I think I'm right about this. Am 
March. Hmm. Oh, okay, yeah. So March 26th, which is uh, in a week, right? Yeah. So next Saturday, there will not be a live stream because we are doing our spring bus tour. We actually get a chartered bus and a bunch of club members get in the bus and we go to four or five fish stores for the day and go shopping all day and then come home with, you know, coolers full of livestock <laughs> that we've acquired. And it's actually really good for the economy too because we all go out there, you know, the 40 of us on this bus or 50 of us, and we all pour into the fish store at once and for the next 45 minutes to an hour, there's a complete chaos as we all buy everything and fill the cash register full of money. And then we go to the next store, the next store, the next store. It's a lot of fun. Uh, between stores, we often do a raffle um, based on, you get tickets based on how much you spent in the last store. So let's just, I'm just gonna throw arbitrary numbers in the air. Let's say I spent 25 bucks. I get a raffle ticket that goes into the bucket because I proved I spent $25 at the first store. Then, you know, someone else spent, you know, a hundred bucks and they get four tickets and it goes into the bin and then they shake the bin up during the drive and they pull out a name and it's like 50 bucks off for the next store. And then you go in there and you get your $50 off of a big coral you like and you spend another $25 or, or maybe you spend a hundred dollars again because you saved 50 bucks on something else or you buy fish food or whatever. And then, you know, you get another ticket and so you can win your way through <laughs> this event. Uh, I don't, think we've had any one person to like win all the prizes. I don't think that happened in the past, but it was a lot of fun. We got to just eat, drink, and visit with each other on the bus. Um, and you don't have to worry about driving because there's a professional driver who's doing this. And we've been doing this for a long time. And this is uh, the first we've done since COVID. And we're finally at the point now where we feel like it's safe enough to do that and enjoy a day. So that is planned for next Saturday. That'd be a lot of fun. If you are a club member, and you haven't signed up for the bus tour, you should definitely sign up now before all the seats are taken. I do know there's a few seats left. <laughs> Mike says there's never enough hours on the day. Been wanting to go to a 36 hour day for the past 20 years. Huh. Uh, two different people, three different people. Wow. Everyone knows about Randy leaving. <laughs> I didn't know anything. Uh, Extra Cargo says Randy is, likes firearms and fishing, so he's going to another company to help with their video presence. Uh, Reef Unlimited said Randy We have guns. And Rick says left BRS to make YouTube videos on how to use machine guns and accessories. Getting married and fiance doesn't like tanks. What doesn't like tanks? Wow. Well, all right, there's the answer, guys. Didn't know anything about that. Oh my God, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> Jason says, I definitely understand not having enough hours in the day, but maybe spending less time shaving will give you time to get stuff done. I know, I spend hours getting this nice smooth look. Smooth as an android's butt. That was good. Let's see. I'm looking for the next uh, question or comment. <laughs> Extra Cargo says, every tool is a hammer. Come on, except a chisel. That's a screwdriver. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, Gabe, thanks very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Alex says, does higher alkalinity increase calcification speed? Yes, uh, usually the desire of having a higher alkalinity in your tank is to increase coral growth or more rapid growth. And growth is calcification of the coral skeleton. Uh, Salty Farm says, what can I safely add to my reef to deal with flukes? I don't want to pull my fish to do a freshwater bath, but I will if I have to. Yeah, I think you're going to have to do that. I don't think there's something you can put in your tank that can just go 
track down your fish and get the flukes. I don't even think a cleaner wrasse would do it. But uh, I would say go to Humblefish for help because he literally just did a video about flukes on YouTube like a day ago. So Humblefish is no, uh, an actual website. It's humble.fish, humble period fish. And just type that in the address bar of your browser, humble period fish, hit enter, and it'll take you to his website. And there's all his advice on how to handle fish disease, including flukes. Um, Michael says, why would my corals, mostly soft corals, grow so slowly? My selenium is 26, temperature 77.8 Fahrenheit, calcium is 450, alkalinity is 8.6, nitrate is 0.1. That sounds unbelievable. Um, phosphates are 0.3. That sounds believable. And pH is 8.3. Your nitrate sounds invisible, like none. 0.1 or 1.0 is like crazy low, but... Softies aren't so demanding. I mean, you've actually tested things that most people that run softies don't even measure. They don't measure nitrate, or they do. They don't measure phosphate. They don't measure um, uh, alkaline and calcium and magnesium. They, they're softies. It's like we care about salinity and we care about temperature and we throw food in the tank. Um, if they're not growing, and I don't know exactly which soft corals you're talking about yet. You haven't told me yet, but they do need to be in a nice, stable tank. And it could even be something as simple as you're not topping off regularly. Like um, I talked to someone a couple days ago who said, I top off my tank every other day. And that's not how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to top off your tank every single day so the salinity stays the same all the time. And if your tank is not stable in some area, corals tend to sit there stagnating rather than growing. So I want to make sure that everything is stable and consistent day after day, week after week, month after month. And if your lighting is consistent and your temperature is consistent and your salinity is consistent and you're feeding some food, those corals should just continue to grow. So how long has this tank been going? How long has it been since you've seen anything grow? What are the soft corals you're talking about? Maybe I can help you. Ah, oh, you're very welcome, Gabe. He said, thanks for the advice on the basement sump. I think you're going to love it. But having some cameras, man, it's just awesome. I mean, Wise makes these cameras for like 30 bucks that you can pivot back and forth and zoom in so you could actually look at things from the comfort of your iPhone or iPad if you're a Mac person, um, Apple person, or if you have a, I'm sure it works for PC and Android people as well. But having those cameras, I mean, I knew one guy who bought an entire home security system just to get the four cameras of the DVR and he rigged them all up around a sump. And he could look at the filter sock to see if the sock was overflowing. He could look at the protein skimmer. He could look at the return zone. Um, and then he, I think he had one of just the entire sump from the side. And it cost him nothing. It was like 100 bucks for the entire setup. And he was like, worth every penny. So, yeah, you can actually go a little crazy and create a whole system of monitoring so you don't have to go down the steps into your basement every single day. But I don't know. I, I might be the kind of guy that does go down there anyway because I want to see what's going on. When I wrap this tank with woodwork, I won't be able to see it from the front. You can bet I'll be walking through that door and looking from the backside and seeing what's going on, or maybe even popping the doors off the front to get a good look and see where things are so that hopefully I don't forget anything and uh, neglect anything. Uh, Chris Durham does make a good point. He says, I hope that 26 salinity is a mistake. If not, that's a problem. Uh, salinity should be 1.026 or it should be 35 PPT. So um, maybe you're just abbreviating for us because you're typing in the chat. And then I think this says Alex as well. This A1EX says, do you have any stocking advice for a 500 liter tank? Take your time. Put in something pretty and enjoy it. And uh, don't overload the tank to where it can't keep up. Thanks for sharing the group, Ed. I appreciate it. As you can tell, I'm always behind on the chat. Uh, Cherry Bacon Astro. What a name. That's got to be. What is, why? What is that name from? Come on. There's a story behind that. I have a tank covered in ACL uh, flatworms. How would you guys treat that? You can actually siphon those out with airline tubing. You can just take the airline tubing, maybe put it on a piece of rigid tubing, and you can just go and just get one at a time and just suck them off into a small bucket. And the reason you use airline tubing 
is you won't pull out a lot of water doing it. And you could spend 15, 20 minutes just slurping out all these flatworms out of your tank one by one and maybe only pull out a gallon of water. And if you were to do that, you can reduce the population down. Uh, there are products to get rid of flatworms, such as flatworm exit. But uh, even if you were going to treat for that, I would say siphon out 90% before you treat the tank to get rid of the last of them. So you do not um, cause chaos in your tank. If you have a bunch of flatworms and you treat the tank with flatworm exit, as the flatworms die, especially red planaria, they release basically ammonia into the water. And it's a huge spike and it can start killing things immediately. So that's why I, I tell people siphon out flatworms every single day for 14 days. And the first three or four days you're doing it, you're going to pull out 100 or 200 or, or whatever. And then the next day, it's like, you didn't do anything. There's just as many as you saw the day before. Just siphon out another 100 or 200. And then the next day, 100 or 200. And then, but after a week of doing this, doing this daily, you know, working on the tank for about 20 minutes, you'll notice there's less. And then, you know, you keep going, going, going. And then finally, you're down to very few. Now you treat the tank to kill off the last of them. Chris, Christ, <laughs> Chris, <laughs> Christ says, will Aptasia ever go away? Two years of battling it. No, they don't go away. They, there will always be some present. The trick is controlling their population. Aw, Simple Reefer, thank you very much for saying that. He says, good info, Mark. Like an OG providing knowledge from experience, no other better way. Been following you since the early 2000s. Thanks. Uh, Tim says, did you move Dory in the past from to the cube because she was eating Zoas? No, when I got the little Dory or, or the blue hippo tang, I got it as a, I think my son got it in a raffle. And it was like one inch. And we just dropped it in the anemone cube because it was an awesome addition. And uh, I loved it because it was tiny, it was blue, and it could go everywhere in that tank. And it, sat, it was in that tank for probably four or five years. And then uh, when it got, it, it got to the point where I just felt like it's time to take it out of the tank. And Caitlin helped me catch it. The, the two of us worked together. It was great. And we got this fish out and we put it in the frag system where it had plenty of room to swim, no tentacles to avoid. And a couple of months later, it was dead. Couldn't believe it. I just came in and it was dead. I have no idea why it died. Okay, um, Sharks 3D gave me some facts. Um, I'm hand dosing, you believe alkalinity, <laughs> over a five minute period, which is totally fine. Dosing at the same time of day, using a Hannah checker at one o'clock. It was 4.7 to 5.5, I finally water changed and it went to 8.4 and dropped to six in five days. Okay, so we dose alkalinity every single day. And I, like I said, you want to dose it in the morning. And if your tank needs 100 milliliters a day, and that's just what it is, you just do it. And you're going to want your alkalinity to be the same number every single day when you test. So if, if you put in every single day at like 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock, and then you test your tank at 1 o'clock, you'll get the real number. And basically, you want to see the right number at 1 o'clock every single day, somewhere around, like you said, 8.4, 8.5, somewhere in there, and just stay there consistently. And if it's not there, either the, the mixture you have is not mixed properly, or maybe you're do, dosing a powder instead of a liquid. I mean, that's a possibility too. That wouldn't be correct. We always mix it up with water. And uh, we want to make sure you're actually dosing alkalinity. Because like you said, your calcium cut going up, but you're not dosing calcium at all. So um, you did mention something about a water change, and it went to 8.4. So it, it sounds to me like you're not at the right level in the first place. And so what you're adding is not enough to get it where it needs to be. I always, you know, I'm always trying to answer questions based on two sentences, which is really hard because I don't have the full picture. And I know you're answering more to give me more insight, which I appreciate because it lets me uh, figure, you know, mull it out and figure it out with you. But basically, if a water change gets your tank to like 8.4, that tells me that your salt mix has a nice high alkalinity level, which is good. And now we just want to keep it there for the rest of the week until your next water change. And so we wanna, if you get your tank to 8.4 and you're dosing, the next day it should be like 8.3 to 8.5, somewhere in there. 
And if it's dropping down to like six and then to five, it's because you're not putting some in. It needs to be in every single day. And we need to put in the right amount. And uh, if you do that, you should be able to stabilize it. It just sounds like we're missing something. Something isn't quite right. Extra Cargo says he just ordered some goods. I'm looking forward to reading the new Coral Magazine with kiddos. Good choice. Um, so the number 7.7 .7 for the alkalinity after a hundred milliliters was dosed during the week, during the week, not during, not daily. Still talking to Sharks 3D, by the way, if you're just listening to this. And I dose in the evening as the lights go out. You want to dose alkalinity in the morning, always the morning. We dose it when the pH is the lowest, not when the pH is at the highest. And then Tim says, how low do you let the calcium reactor get before you fill it back up? What's your average pH on it? And when do you test the effluent? What is the DKH? Uh, lots of questions. Okay, so I'll start off. When the reactor is about a third down from the top, I put more in. Um, if I let it get a little lower, I mean, I've had it run to halfway or even three quarters of the way down, and I'm down to kind of mush at the bottom. At that point, I just throw away, well, I pour out all the meat into a bucket, and I rinse it with water, and I grab handfuls of what is grabbable and put that back on the reactor with a bunch of new media and I fill it up to the top. Uh, my pH in the reactor, I believe, is somewhere around 6.8. Uh, the last time I checked my DKH coming out of the reactor, it was measuring, I think it was 25 or 28. Um, and you want to be between 19 and 35. So my number was right there where I needed it to be. Uh, my flow rate coming out of my reactor is 60 milliliters a minute, which uh, one day I did some math and I think it came out to like six gallons a day. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting little side thing I'd never really thought about. Yep, coffee spot in the new building is important. I'm also going to need a comfortable chair in that building. Uh, I'd like a sofa in there, but I don't think there's going to be room for one if I want to work. So I'll have to figure out what I can do. But that's later. For now, I just want to be able to go in there and work. <laughs> Andrea says, I told you they missed the beard. Well, you know, um, my parents hated it. And uh, I went to visit them. So now that they're, uh, they're satisfied, they got to see me, maybe I could grow it back. But I don't really want to. It was a lot of maintenance. Uh, Chad Chan says, have you ever force fed a fish? No, I have not. <laughs> have you? <laughs> um, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. So I'm just going to say happy birthday, Mrs. Skull Squadron V F 84. <laughs> you didn't tell me your name, <laughs> but no, that's great. Happy birthday. You should get cake and and shiny gifts. Akbar says, show us your anemone tank. I can't. There's nothing there. Um... Ah, thank you, Cherry Bacon Astro. He explained the story behind the name. I used to be a moderator on a Minecraft server and was called Cherry Bacon. And I'm also into astrophotography. Very nice. I bet you've been really enjoying the stars out lately. And man, the moon was amazing the last couple of nights. I had, you know, I, I walk Jack at night when it's a little cooler and less people are out there. And man, the moon was like orange. And the longer we walked, the brighter orange it got or deeper orange. It was really, really nice. And then I went out there again a couple hours later. I was like, oh yeah, I want to see if it's still orange. And it wasn't, it was white. But we had a period where it looked really, really cool. I think they call that the Harvest Moon. Uh, Andrew says, I received some biota mandarins. They're a quarter and, they're a quarter and a half inches. Okay. And they're eating baby and shrimp and mastic. Do you have any information about the growth rate for mandarins? Well, as long as they're eating, they will just grow. I don't have specific information, no. But uh, that is a very small fish. And 
I, if I were to get some mandarins, I wouldn't want to put them in my big tank because I'd never see them again. I mean, maybe they'd survive, maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. But mandarins are, um, they're shy. They, they're finicky. And so they don't uh, do well in a tank full of aggressive, active eating fish. So you pour food in the tank and all the crazy fish just go nuts on the confetti and the mandarin doesn't get anything to eat because the other ones are just pushing ahead and devouring it all. So I would say if you're going to have a fish that small, it needs to kind of be in a small tank till it grows to be larger to where you can finally move it into a reef where it's a, a decent size. You know, if, if it was um, two, three inches long, you'll have more of a than you will with such a small fish from biota right now. And, you know, one day I will get some and I'll have to figure out what to do with mine. Trevor says, are you putting Minion in the new building? If so, are you not tempted to have a bigger frag tank in the garage? No, I am leaving Minion in the workshop. The studio is where everything's going to be built. So the benefit being that I can build the orders out there, I can uh, clean them all up, I can pack, ship, label, everything happens there. But all the, the heavy cutting gets done in the workshop itself. And uh, I'm thinking about adding a new tool to the workshop once everything's decluttered from there to where I'm down to Minion and a, and a prep table, then I would like to add a laser cutter as well. So that's on my list of things I'd like to buy. Uh, Chan says, I've not force fed that fish, but I asked because I can never get new tangs to eat. I've gone through about five in about a year and none of them ate. Well, I don't know where you're buying your fish, but if you are in a fish store and you're picking it out, ask them to feed the fish in front of you so you can see that the tang is eating, okay? That's the first step. And if it is eating, then, and you like it and it looks healthy, buy the fish and buy the food that they fed the fish. So you're coming home with a fish that likes that food, okay? You got both parts in your hands. Then when you get home, your acclimation procedure should be of proper duration to where you're not stressing out the fish. Um, I like to acclimate a fish in about 45 minutes. None of this two or three hour business that I hear people doing. I'm My water that comes out of the tank that goes into the acclimation holder would be coming in at a trickle, not a drip. I have a small heater in there so the water doesn't get too cold during the acclimation. You can add an air stone if you wanna make sure there's enough oxygen in the water during the acclimation. And then I put it through safety stop, which is a two part bath I mentioned earlier in this stream. And it's slow. I mean, the whole process is taking like two, three hours for the entire, from the moment of bringing home the bagged fish to getting it into my aquarium. And then once it's in my aquarium, I don't actually set it loose into the reef. I put it in the Peacemaker, which is an acrylic box that spans the tank. It's got a bunch of holes in it. And I put the new fish in there and I put the lid on top so it can't jump out, so it won't die. And then every, I feed that box with the fish several times. I put, I have a little small hole in the lid and I use a pipette and I squirt food in there multiple times so that that fish has an opportunity to eat and eat and eat. And I also will pour food in the tank at the same time um, in the evening and I'll put some of that food in the, into the box so that the food blowing around and the, the newcomer is all getting a meal. But while that new fish is sitting in the peacemaker, it is de-stressing. And after three days of being in that box, I will then pour it into the tank. But um, that's what works for me. And maybe something along those descriptions I just made, you could apply some of that to your own situation and maybe have better success. But I don't know anyone that can force feed a tang <laughs> and make it live. I mean, that's just not how that works. We um, want a healthy specimen. We want one that is eating food. We want to make sure that we get the right food they like. And then we want to keep doing that regularly and uh, feed it frequently. And you know, tangs, they are herbivores more they're not omnivores which means they really need a, a veggie diet and using sheet nori is one trick um and you know if the fish is skittish and is scared of a big piece of nori take the big piece and tear it into a much smaller piece and put that in the tank or hold the piece in the tank and just rub your fingers to break it up into little flakes that goes everywhere also you can put flake food in the tank that is another choice pellet food in the tank is another choice Live brine is another trick that can work. Black worms may possibly be eaten by tangs. I don't know for sure, but it is a living food, which sometimes works. 
Arctopods from Reef Nutrition is another nice nutritious food you can put in there. And all these different things we use are things you can rotate through to hopefully get those tangs to do better. But I, you know, you said five tangs in a year, didn't have luck with any of them eating. Makes me wonder, was it the food choice? Was it the acclimation situation? Was it the fish store selling you bad fish? Which does happen. You know, it's, these are all important things that you have to analyze and figure out. And maybe, like I said, this big long answer that I gave you, gave you some thoughts of like, oh, I could try this, this, and this. And maybe you can tell me a week or two from now, I've had success and I've got this beautiful such and such. Uh, Lorena says, what other fish do you keep in the anemone tank besides clownfish? Um, I did have the two, um, the two gobies. What are they called? Bartlett. I always forget when I need to know that. But anyway, two gobies were in the bottom of the tank. And there was also some Bengay cardinal, uh, yeah, Bengay cardinal fish in there. And that was it. There's uh, 12 clowns and like 5,000 anemones. <laughs> All right. And Michael says, yes, he was abbreviating the salinity. It was 1.026. Everyone stand down, stand down, put away the pitchforks, put out those torches. We don't have to go after this guy. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, okay. You said earlier that your toadstools and your, you said your soft corals weren't growing. Try this. Um, your water parameters all sound good. Your nitrates sound a little low to me. I think you could feed a little bit more heavily. Um, one other thing you could do, that may suddenly give you a burst of growth from the soft corals. Run some fresh carbon in a reactor. It's a half a cup per 50 gallons. Put in a reactor, water has to flow through the reactor and through the carbon to come back out. And run that on the tank for a few days and see if that doesn't help polish the water and get rid of some allelopathy, which is um, chemical warfare between corals. And you might see it grow you have more of them. And it's sort of like grass growing. You know, you don't see the grass growing, but you have to mow it once a week. And your corals should increase. Now, zoanthids, there's no, like, speed rate when it comes to those. Those things just take forever. And you might see a few new polyps. And eventually, a year from now, you have a nice patch of them. But, um, you know, the toadstool leather, it's a gradual grower. I grew one from the size of, you know, this much meat to something that filled a 33-gallon trash can. It took a long time, but it got bigger and bigger, and it was awesome, and I loved it. And um, other kind of leathers, like finger leathers and devil's hands, those kind of things, they just kind of do their thing gradually, and you just notice over time as you take pictures once a month, hey, it, there's more than before, and your, your tank just looks better and better. So I would just say running carbon might make a difference, and you might see a, a pickup. Also, if you want, you can do more water changes and maybe just the elements that are included in the salt mix can make the difference. All right, guys, we've been talking almost two hours and that was with a no topic live stream. So let's just stop here. Please do test your water. It is water test Saturday. You want to verify all your parameters to make sure everything's stable because testing water saves lives. And I appreciate all your questions today. I really had a good time with you. I'm going to take a little break, eat something, and then get back to work because I have to keep building things for my customers. And I thank you for tuning in, and I will 